Brown and Chen, Sarah Harris, and we will hear to listen in from them later tonight. We also have our head of school, Grant Beckwith, and we also have uh, Leland Anderson, principal of our Solid campus. It's pretty salty. Let me see if I can turn it off. I'll have to call the back. We are going to open our meeting tonight by singing hymn number 259, The Hope of Israel. We'll be singing the first three verses. Blaine Hunsaker, our assistant principal of middle school and performing arts, will be conducting that. And Laura Hale, our former present serv parent service organization president, will be playing the piano. After the song, we will have an opening prayer by Rob Olmstead, our parent of the community. Hope it is real to Presentation I will address you next. Barbara Chen. 
Constitution Day Festival or to the Family Dance in the Spring, you have seen Shannon's skills on display. She really is an extraordinary events planner. She has an incredible committee of parent volunteers that work with her to put on those huge events. And we're just so grateful for her efforts and for the efforts of her committee. Shannon's going to tell you more about the Family Sock Hop that's coming up on March 25th in just a moment. But first, I get to say thank you. At the parent meeting, Last fall, I announced that the board had approved a $15 million campaign to establish an endowed scholarship fund at American Heritage School to provide financial aid to families who need a little help in order to attend AHS. Once the endowment is fully funded, and it will take us a few years, um, we will no longer need an annual cash campaign, which is the annual fund, to provide student scholarships and teacher tuition benefits, as well as Christmas and end of year um, teacher bonuses. I want to say thank you for your generosity in helping us launch this campaign. I'm very pleased to report that because of you, we've raised more than $816,000 so far this year for the endowment and annual fund. Thank you for the sacrifices you make on behalf of each other. It's really a blessing for us to witness that. Thank you especially for your generosity in supporting the Christmas bonus. We received, that's part of the annual fund total. It's in that $816,000 that you see displayed on the screen. We received nearly 100 donations for the Christmas bonus through our uh, Giving Tuesday campaign, and it was just fantastic. The $816,000 figure is even more impressive when you consider that we are also fundraising for several other strategic priorities approved by the board. Thank you to the donors. I want to show you those other priorities here. And both of these um, graphics come from the annual magazine. They're on page 69, which is in the advancement section of that magazine. So I'm not going to spend time walking you through everything you're looking at, but it does show you the kind of generosity that we're talking about from members of our school community who have helped us launch these very ambitious um, fundraising campaigns that go beyond the annual fund. So, um, Anyway, as I was saying, that there are other strategic priorities that have been approved by the board, and I want to thank the donors who have provided such a generous lift to help launch these campaigns um, as well. We really are very grateful. Finally, I just want to thank you for your warmth and your um, graciousness when I reach out to you. I understand that families go through periods of abundance and they go through periods of scarcity. And I appreciate that you know that I don't know what season your family is in until I talk with you. Um, philanthropy really is all about timing. That's such a critical factor. And sometimes the time just simply isn't right. But there are times when it is right and it feels good. And uh, if you're in that stage, um, I really want to talk to you. And if you're not in that stage, I really want to talk to you. Because circumstances change, as we all know. I don't know any family that has accumulated wealth that hasn't been through a period of tremendous scarcity. Um, and, and I just appreciate that you, uh, that you're gracious and warm to me when I reach out. I look forward to getting to know all of you better, and especially those that I haven't had a conversation with. I'm excited to meet you and get to know you. And I'm grateful for this chance to represent American Heritage School. So let me turn it over to Shannon now. and one in ninth grade. So uh, my heart is here, and um, I just think we can all agree as parents that this last couple of years with COVID, um, if nothing else, we've gained a greater appreciation for what a teacher does for our children. And so I just, I, I asked for a couple of notes from Mr. Beckwith for some of the thank yous that were given to him by the teachers for just the Christmas bonus. And so I just wanted to read one of these. It said, would you please pass this note 
Monta who's ever it should go to. I want to thank all that made it possible to give the bonuses that were given. Thank you so much. It truly makes it possible for me to have a nice Christmas for my family and to pay bills that come up unexpectedly. I feel so blessed and I appreciate the generous giving of all. I wish I had more words that express my feelings and appreciation, but I hope you will feel the love that is sent with this message. So I just kind of want to paraphrase Governor Cox, who said in his State of the State address, he said, our teachers are on mile 42 of what was promised to be a 26.2 mile COVID marathon. So I think we can all appreciate that. And so the family saw cop, which is, um, it's also in your magazine. There's an advertisement for that. So this particular event is meant to let our hair down and have a lot of fun, but also we have a silent auction component. And this is a participation for everyone. In the auction, we will have items as, as inexpensive as $5. And so the goal is for everyone to give whatever level they can because this money will go to the end of year bonuses as a part of what these teachers will receive. And so it's a great way to say thank you and then bring your family and let's just have some fun. It's a great way to introduce people to the school as well. So you can see the date and time on there. Um, so what I need from you is to get on to the school web page. You'll see under the events tab a way that you can click on this and it'll allow you to buy tickets, but also I need your donations. So, you know, the silent auction is things that you all bring. And we also have teachers that donate, even students will donate services. So all together, when we put this together, we usually raise about $45,000 that will go towards that bonus. And so it's really, it's really wonderful when we can all work together to thank our teachers this way. So this will be at the end of Teacher Appreciation Week. So this will be the culmination of that whole week for them. So hopefully they'll just feel of our love and appreciation. Um, just want to make sure I have everything covered. So the auction is going to be donations, and then when it's time for the auction to go live, we'll send out a general text, and you can go through and, and see all the items. Um, <clears throat> donate even if you can't come. There's a tab on the auction site that just says donate now. And um, tonight you can sign up with the PSO ladies. They're asking for helpers, so I need help that evening to serve sort of refreshments and to just monitor the track on the auction. So um, there's a chance to get your volunteer hours in. So anyway, we just would love to all have, have you all there, and it's going to be a really fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bart and Shannon. We greatly appreciate all of your efforts to do classy things and to bless this entire community. Okay, this next item I want to get through very quickly. Um, first, let's talk about what's in your packet. I'm not going to go through every item that you picked up, or you should have picked up the white envelope as you came in down this hallway. The one thing that I will draw attention to is the bottom item in this color-coded legend, the Transformation Magazine. What is that exactly? I've never heard of that before. Many of you who have been here for several years are familiar with our annual report, which we put out every year around this time. This is basically a replacement for the annual report. Imagine the quantitative items included in the annual report. Now add to that some qualitative human interest pieces and you get the transformation magazine. Transformational scholarship is the middle of our three brand attributes here at American Heritage School, hence the name transformation. Please watch for an email from our admissions department uh, Monday. You will have a lot of details in there about automatic re-enrollment, re-enrollment, a reminder of our subscription basis of, of tuition payments, and a few other things. If you need to withdraw, if you plan to withdraw, uh, if you think you might withdraw, please read that email carefully so there are no surprises. Jeff, please raise your hand. This handsome man over here, Jeff Pinus, uh, he is one of three of our full-time faculty who are actively involved on the presentation side of our Constitution and Civility Center, which really launched this year. Uh, he's handed out a, a salmon-colored flyer to many of you on your way, and if you didn't get that, see him. But it's basically a little leaflet that, that captures all of the key data points of this upcoming event that allows your students who are particularly interested in the Constitution to enjoy a fun activity and potentially earn some money. So see Jeff and get a flyer. 
the growth of the school and the, the increase of student drivers and the distribution of our population across now two buildings has created some complication when it comes to checking out students midday. We've tried to streamline that this week for you and for our front office to make everyone's lives a little bit more pleasant. When you need to check out a student, please go here on the parent portal and click on one of these two links to be guided through a series of additional pages. Um, just to streamline that process, make it a lot simpler. Um, and please do this rather than making phone calls to the front office. They get many, many, many phone calls related to this every hour. So we're trying to help them. We have a bit of a problem to report. Um, for those of you who can't see the chalk drawing inside the, uh, the, the swimming fish, it says, don't follow the crowd, follow Jesus. As you can see, we found the culprits, um, and as you can also see, they, they, they clearly have no, no sense of remorse or contrition. Um, and if you think that this is isolated to just the elementary building, the high school building has the same issue in play as well. They just pick a different medium. They choose post-it notes. Again, if you can't read this, I'll read the one on the right side here. Jesus shows his mercy and kindness to me through those that surround me. I know and have an assurance of that. So as we deal with this problem, we try to figure out what to do with it as, as an administration. I have to joke again about something that I, I, a refrain that I rehearse often with my coworkers, and it's this, that I would never, ever trade our problems here for problems elsewhere. We love our problems, and we love seeing this. Okay, please remember during carpool to go clockwise around the elementary building. Clock, uh, carpool is defined as 8 to 8.30 a.m. and 3 to 3.30 p.m. on normal days. Please be conscientious of the crosswalk zones. Please do not park there, do not idle there, and do not park close to them either. Please do not park and leave your car against a yellow curb during carpool times. Uh, that's for active loading and unloading only. If you need to park, please find a stall. Please also help us to be good neighbors to the surrounding neighbors on not just this side shown here, but all sides of the school. Please drive the speed limit when going through those neighborhoods. And otherwise, just help us to be a good citizen in the area. Okay, what's new and what's exciting? I asked my assistant principals to give me some of their favorite new and exciting items to highlight. And they gave me three pages of summary. And because I have to move fast tonight, I got to pick six items from that to highlight on the next three slides. These are not the six most important items. These are just six items that I chose that give you a little bit of a broad sense of what's new and exciting. In the lower grades, we are revamping our PE curriculum. Our PE department chair has informed us of a very interesting statistic. Most Americans stop exercising after the age of 25. Why? Because most Americans' orientation to physical exercise is, is, is really built around team sports. And when they graduate college and they leave those roommates, and they, and they get married, and they move somewhere else for work, they leave the pickup basketball group that they were with for so long. And unless they have developed the habits of individualized exercise, they tend to stop exercising. So we are reorienting, we're going through an evolution right now with our PE curriculum to reorient that a little bit to help our youngest students to develop that orientation early, have an affinity for it, familiarity with it, so that they are more likely to enjoy lifelong wellness. The other image here is our newly launched space simulator. You've probably seen lots of updates on that uh, in the school-wide bulletins that come out every week or two. We are so grateful for the parents that have helped that come to pass. Our fifth through eighth graders are now going to have as many as 12 missions per year. This is more than just fun make-believe time. These missions are, are better thought of as, as um, active story problems, where the science and the math that they're learning in the classroom now has expression and experiential manifestation here. It's fun, they enjoy it, they're getting excited about it. 
in our upper grades. We're getting a lot of feedback from our high school students that they love the fact that we've moved away from survey courses, ninth grade history, 10th grade English, and so on and so forth. Instead, we're giving them these more topic-specific courses that may, may be a little narrower, but dive much deeper. And they are just, they're relishing in that, having a much more enjoyable time. Okay, on the uh, extracurricular front, front, 6.30, 6.30, 6.30. Many years ago, we were getting a lot of consistent feedback from this group, our parent group, that we were giving too much homework. And that was a problem because it was competing with all of the very important things that you want and need to do at home at night. Well, we've been thinking a lot about 6.30, and 6.30 is, is a limit, an upper limit, that we are now trying to observe with those parts of our extracurricular activities that we have control over. We can't always control when the games are, but we can control when rehearsals and practices and things of that nature are. We're trying to have them end by 6.30 because your children need to be home for family dinner hour. Your children need to be home for other personal pursuits or for family activities. Your children need to be able to participate fully in their young men and young women groups and be called upon for leadership responsibilities there. That is absolutely just as much a part of their education as whatever we do here. Um, in our performing arts, we're excited to announce new ensembles. We've got a fourth choir, we have a seventh and eighth orchestra component, a harp ensemble, and then a brass and woodwind band. And then on the athletic front, lots and lots and lots of accomplishments there, and I've just picked four here. We've had several teams that have run deep into the playoffs, and two recently who went all the way and won the championship. Okay, this next update, you will want to hug and perhaps even kiss the assistant principals when I, when I finish telling you about this one. So historically, we have tracked the, uh, the, the, the typical calendaring conventions, right, uh, that most schools follow, which is to have three prolonged breaks in a school year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter or spring break elsewhere. We've added a fourth, and it's that nice red block right there in February. Why did we add that there? Well, traditionally and historically, that January to March period was the longest, the darkest, the coldest, um, perhaps the least motivated period of the year. And I think you'll find that it's also when the, the, the plane tickets are the cheapest and the lines at Disneyland are the shortest. And I'm sure you'll find all kinds of other superlatives to, 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 to give us feedback with as you begin to experience that break in February. So we're very glad to be able to give that to you. We'll have to start one day sooner and one day later and then do a little bit of musical cheers in between. And we still maintain the same number of days, the same number of seat hours. Okay. The credit again goes to the assistant principal, so please don't hug and kiss me. Um, thank you for responding to our request for survey feedback. About a quarter of you gave us feedback. That gets us obviously to a, a level of statistical significance where we can be very confident on uh, the information you received. Um, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. We have not yet had time to really dive deeply into this, but I'm going to highlight a few key stories here. Uh, this was a new question, and I apologize for those of you who are way in the back, it may be hard for you to read some of this text. Um, but this question basically asks, you know, how are we doing at helping your students to have a balanced life in the Luke 252 sense of it? Social, intellectual, physical, spiritual. Uh, my favorite piece on this is the one at the very bottom. Obviously, all of this is tending towards the left, which is the strongly agree and somewhat agree side of the spectrum. Bottom one. Social, my child feels a close connection to one or more teachers. 96 strongly agree. Really dark green there. We're very pleased that you feel that way and that they feel that way. School's impact on your family life. Um, again, mostly to the left. Strongly agree, somewhat agree. Third one down is my favorite here. The school reinforces the values I am teaching at home. 110 strongly agree. We couldn't be more pleased than to know that you feel that way. New question, how do you feel about our four standards at the school? 
the vast majority of you are right in that just right column where you feel like these standards are, are hitting the mark right where you want them to be. This is sort of a new question. We used to ask you two free response questions. Why did you come and why do you stay? And as we reviewed those through the last few years, we saw some very consistent themes. And this year, we replaced those two free response questions with a ranking question where we took the 10 most common themes and just said, of these themes, these attributes that you've described in the past to describe us, uh, tell us which ones are most important. The thing that I find most interesting about this data set here is the first five versus the last five. Um, items 6 through 10 that you in aggregate rent. I look at those academic rigor, small class sizes, course variety, high quality campus, extracurricular programs. Those to me are the kinds of things that you would typically use as benchmarks to assess lots and lots of different schools against each other. And those are more traditional educational benchmarks. You put those as your second priority collectively. What did you put as your first priority? Faith infused curriculum, loving teachers, Christian-based curriculum, standards, safety. These are the things that I would call our differentiating factors. And again, it's very heartening to see that those are the things that you actually place at the top. As I look at this, I basically interpret that as you telling me, keep the main thing, the main thing. And we intend to do that. Homework. Uh, this is a question we will always ask. We got some, some negative reviews in years past. We've made a lot of adjustments, and we continue to see some positive feedback there. Uh, quality of the overall programs, uh, mostly positive here. We still have some areas to work on. Um, I'm pleased to announce that we are actually in the process of making some very important investments from a personnel perspective on the technology front. We are going to be really boosting up um, our our computer technology department, um, and we'll see a lot of that roll out next year. Overall sentiment. Three quarters of you feel extremely grateful and fortunate to be here, and 93% of you have at least somewhat positive feelings about being here, and, and not really many concerns to mention. Uh, down below, on a scale of 1 to 10, you're ranking us about a 9 in terms of how satisfied you are. Um, now we switch over to the, the personnel survey, the second survey. Um, I just picked one question from that. All of them kind of looked like this, where that far left strongly agree column was just dark, dark green. This one, please evaluate your chosen person's performance. Of course, here you're not seeing any specific person, but you're seeing the aggregation of all of the people, and again, far, far, far on the left side. We don't ignore the fact that we don't pretend that that far right side also doesn't exist, where there are some strongly disagrees, and we want and we need to listen to those, and we're grateful that many of you did provide us some detail there in the free response columns, or fields, rather. Okay, last agenda item that I'll be addressing tonight. Technology conversation number three. Why number three? Uh, it's not your third conversation about technology this year, it's my third conversation about technology this year. Um, the first conversation came in November when I invited um, a new couple here at the school who are here tonight, Robbie and Jessica Harmon. Uh, I invited them to come and address our faculty on appreciating the benefits and the blessings of technology while also appreciating and being aware of some of the distractions and, and uh, problems that can come, and therefore the need to bridle and to set boundaries. Uh, the Harmons have a lot of experience owning and operating addiction recovery centers, and more recently they are actually transitioning more to the prevention side of that problem. And so they have a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience to share with us. Um, I want to just show you here one piece of information that we got from them. Just watch a short video here real quick. In 2017, researchers looked at the effect of cell phone presence on students. Students were asked to complete math problems with their cell phones placed on their desks 
stashed in nearby bags or clothing, or left behind in separate rooms. They turned off ringtones, buzzing, pings, the works. In fact, students didn't interact with or hear the phones at all. But it didn't matter. The phone continued to exert powerful influence, occupying the students' mental space even as they ignored it. Students performed worse when the phone was nearby on the desk. And no, it didn't matter if they turned it face down. They didn't fare much better when the phone was hidden in a bag or pocket. Physical separation from the phone produced the best outcomes. So, what's the new insight here? It looks like the mere presence of our phones might be triggering a neural system called automatic attention. That's a brain system that unconsciously monitors the environment for signs of critical importance. It screens out irrelevant information, but snaps us to attention when someone calls our name, for example, an infant cries, or a police siren wails. In other words, our phones, with their constant pings and buzzes, may be tripping some of our deepest mission-critical wiring, creating a persistent sense of urgency even when the phone is completely off or stored away and draining away precious cognitive resources that could be used for tasks like study. What can be done about all this? The researchers concluded that intuitive fixes like placing the phone face down or turning it off were futile. And that's a direct quote. Actual physical separation from the phone was the only effective solution. That's true when your students are taking tests, of course. But the research says that physical separation is even more crucial when they are initially trying to learn something. This first conversation with faculty ended with me giving them an invitation. An invitation to conduct some experiments in their classroom where they would seek to create some new boundaries and realize a little bit greater cognitive focus on the part of their students. Now let's uh, fast forward to conversation number two. This one, the audience changed. The audience included your middle and high school students. Among other things, during that conversation, I invited them to consider this counsel from Lehi to his family in the, in the uh, last little bit of his ministry. Students were asked to consider whether they were actors in control of their phones or rather just objects being controlled by their phones. They were asked to consider whether they reflexively reach into their pocket, whether they manage their alerts such that their phones get a voice in their life only when they carefully decide to allow such a voice. Did their phone demand of them that it always be with them? Or are they in control enough to be willing to park it elsewhere at various times of the day? This conversation, like the first one, also concluded with some invitations. I invited the students to consider some new boundaries to create a, a greater degree of control over the impulse triggering and time draining aspects of their phones. Now, in inviting these experiments with and these adoptions of new, more deliberate boundaries of both the faculty and the students, we are speaking in terms of three different objectives. We want our students intellectually undistracted so that they can learn and perform at their best. We want our students socially undistracted so that they can connect in dynamic and deep ways with people who are physically next to them. We want our students spiritually undistracted so that they don't miss those precious opportunities to hear him. Now, in this third conversation that I'm having with you, I also want to extend an invitation. In the next newsletter email that will be circulated by Mr. Beckwith, I will be offering a short essay wherein I will be sharing with you parents a little bit more about the message that I gave earlier to the middle and high school students. At the end of that message, I will include links to a few different videos. One will be focused on cognitive distraction, one on social distraction, and one on spiritual distractions emanating from cell phones. The videos will include voices of social scientists and of modern day prophets and will total about 10 minutes in length. My invitation to you is that you watch those with your children and then you also provision time immediately after to discuss 
with your children in your home and consider how their lives might be blessed by adopting some additional boundaries. Let me now segue to our next presenter, Dr. Janet Erickson. Um, in the few short months that I've been in the role that I currently have, um, I've had a handful of instances where student discipline issues have escalated to my office. And there are two common denominators that I've found as I review in my mind each of those events that I would say are, are on the more severe end of our student discipline spectrum. What are they? Cell phones and a vulgar approach to sexuality. I invited you to watch some videos and have a discussion with your students about cell phones over the next two week period when we get that, that prompt in the newsletter. I have another invitation for you. I'm inviting you to come with your spouse to this parent lecture next Friday night. Not tomorrow night, a week from tomorrow night. Dr. Janet Erickson will address us next. She will provide a short preview tonight of the longer and more in-depth message she will share next week. Her message will equip parents with the tools they need to help their children adopt a healthy, positive, and divine view of sexuality that can counter the base, inaccurate, like-minded, and fundamentally selfish view of sexuality so pervasive in the world today. Now, some of you may be reflecting upon that point that I made a few minutes ago about student discipline. You may be thinking to yourself, he's describing bad kids and someone else's family, someone else's problem. Uh, let me just be clear by saying that those events that I described involved very good kids from great families. I want, to ask your, I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions here. Is Satan allowing for the convenient segregation of content in ways that were maybe a little more typical of my youth and your youth? Or is he instead pursuing an integration strategy today in the communication and entertainment channels that our youth are subscribing to. Next question. When my youth, when my child comes across sexualized messages, vulgar content, or other concerning information, will they understand it for what it is, the way I would if I were the one seeing it? Or do they simply take note that other people are laughing at it? Then, do they, as beings who yearn for acceptance, validation, and opportunity to perform for their peers, say to themselves, that made people laugh. And if I repeat it, I can make people laugh. And if I hear it repeated by somebody else within a peer group of mine, I need to make sure I'm part of the group that laughs, so that I am seen as being part of the in crowd. Good children raised in excellent families can easily stumble onto content that they do not fully understand. They can imitate it, repeat it, or eventually go further in exploring it. Dr. Erickson's objective tonight is to enable parents to be confident, confident in their approach to addressing sexuality with their children. We might wish we could wind back the clock to an earlier era where the parents could remain silent or at the very least be more reserved on these topics. But adopting that outdated strategy today only grants to our adversary a monopoly at the microphone of their mind. Dr. Erickson is a member of our board of directors. She is an alumna of the school's former Pleasant Grove campus. And she is a professor in BYU's Colleges of Family Sciences and Religion, where she teaches the general education course on the family, a proclamation to the world. Dr. Erickson, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Chase. It's wonderful to be here and to meet new families who are here, just, just to feel the strength. I feel like every time I come in, we are working together to create a better world and a better experience for our children in their early years and their growing up, and it's, it's such a powerful team to be on. 
I am really grateful we started talking about this topic. I've actually been working on it in, in my stake calling as well as in my professional work. And I was so inspired by the fact that we really have the truths we need to address this very challenging and significant and beautiful topic of sexuality. And we absolutely have to do it. There is no delay. It is time. Um, at American Heritage, we work on developing integrity. It's part of our transformational scholarship effort. Not the appearance of goodness in children, but the ability for real goodness, grounded in living true to their consciences, governed by the best within themselves, governed by moral reasoning, moral judgment, and making choices that are good for themselves and for those around them. We want them to grow in their ability to be honest with themselves about their intent, doing what is right for the right reasons, growing beyond compliance to taking deep responsibility for themselves, not placing that responsibility at the feet of others, including the school or the church or their own families. That requires moving beyond a behavioristic orientation and a compliance-based frame of mind to becoming stronger and wiser, acting with integrity. There is this dimension that we especially want to address, that of healthy sexuality. And as Chase referenced, living in a sexually explicit culture has made it essential to teach the truth about the divine role of healthy sexuality. That means bringing sexuality out of the darkness and into the light where we together can confidently learn how to talk about it, learn how to help our children understand it, and use it for the divine purpose for which it was given, to bring goodness into their lives. Fears around the very real dangers of sexuality, and I speak of myself, with very little understanding or teaching that sexuality is inherent to every human being, that we are sexual beings, and that it is a gift given to each of us, women and men, to use for goodness and strength. Not having that teaching has largely left us and our youth with the message that sex is mysterious and shameful, to be feared, that it controls us, that we secretly and shamefully indulge it because we have no power over it, and we can find in it an easy escape. Beautiful and empowering truths that are part of the restoration of the, of the gospel have been co-opted by a message that intends to harm them through sexuality, rather than the truth that enables them to use it as a gift of strength, what it was intended to be. Our youth internalize the message that sexuality and sexual feelings are mysterious, titillating, and bad, driving a fear-based focus on sexuality taking them out of the driver's seat in the use of this gift. Some of this fear comes because of our own fears and anxieties about sexuality. Fear then leads us to shame and use more fear as a way to control their behaviors. This has shown up for me in multiple ways, fearing their curiosity about their bodies, teaching them it must be scary because we don't talk about it, or when we do, we are really uncomfortable all of which they can perfectly map in us. In this next weekend's presentation on the topic, I want to help us turn that fear on its head. Our goal is to enable ourselves and our children to develop the ability to integrate the God-given gift of their sexuality into their lives by strengthening their awareness and understanding of it, empowering them to make wise choices with it, not just telling them, don't look at it. We want them to develop a strong sense of understanding and stewardship, and we have no reason not to. We have all the truth to do that. Helping them develop not compliance, not defiance, not compulsivity, and not repression, but healthy integration of that gift. This means teaching them, it begins with teaching them that sexuality is not inherently good nor bad. It is fundamental to being human, made in the image of heavenly parents. What we do with it 
will determine whether it is good or bad, whether we relate to it in a way that strengthens and enriches our lives, or whether we choose to relate to it in a way that is destructive. Just like other sources of pleasure in our lives, money, food, etc., what we do with them is what determines their goodness in our lives. But our children need to understand what it is they're working with before they can understand how to use it in good ways. As our youth move towards adulthood, their bodies become capable of reproduction, which includes becoming capable of romance and attraction. All of this is good. It's essential for adulthood and the deepest experiences of love. But this process is not easy. It involves feelings of insecurity, uncertainty, mystery, conflicting feelings, and including a mix of self-doubt, sexual feelings, romantic feelings, exciting feelings, and guilt. All of this is normal, but it's uncomfortable, and it's not an easy process, and they need our help to be able to do it. Seeking to help them understand it, talking about it naturally in its wholeness, strengthens our children's ability to be deliberate and thoughtful about where and when their gift is expressed. Not because it is bad, but because it is so powerful. Strengthening their ability to use this powerful language in ways that they themselves will want for their lives means helping them and giving them space to think deeply about what they want for their relationships, what they think is the right way to use this powerful language, so that rather than vacillating between peers and parents and media and pornography, they are deliberately choosing to use this gift in ways that are consistent with their deepest values and desires. I'll just highlight a few questions that we will tackle in the discussion next week. And there are other people way more experienced and uh, knowledgeable about this topic. And I will help guide us into other resources while, while touching on each of the following. What are guidelines for how we talk about the body and about sexuality across our children's development in ways that builds awareness, confidence, and stewardship rather than fear? The next one, how can we strengthen children in developing the capacity to relate to any source of pleasure with healthy integration, awareness, and again, stewardship, enabling it to be a source of goodness and joy rather than running their life. The next, what specifically can we do to respond to pornography in ways that build agency, confidence, and integrity rather than shame and compulsivity? How can we recognize the distortions about sexuality that are per pervasive that Principal Hale referenced? And how can we help our children to recognize them and know differently when they are in a world that is saturated with those distortions. And finally, how can we teach modesty in a way that does not feed into the pervasive cultural message that women are managing the sexuality of men, but deeply grounds our daughters in truth about respect for themselves and others and responsibility in the use of their own precious sexuality? I cannot think of a more important thing to talk about today, and I can't think of a better place to do that than right here through the parents at American Heritage School, that we can start to change a culture by reclaiming the truth about this precious gift of sexuality, increasing our children's ability to be aware of it, to understand it, to appreciate it, to recognize it, and to use it with integrity in their lives, because they want to do that. And so I hope that we can just continue to grow in this and spread that understanding with all we are in contact with, beginning first with our beautiful children. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Erickson. Before I announce our final presenter for the evening, I just want to um, echo something that she said and also clarify something that I maybe should have clarified before. 
Uh, Dr. Erickson just said she can think of no better way for us to address this need than through the parents. American Heritage School does not teach sexual education. We do not see it as our role, we see that as your role. There is no better place for such a very intimate topic that requires tailoring, requires tailoring by someone who knows the individual but, you know, as well as a parent does. No better place to do that, and that's why we're making this, this lecture available to you as a, as, a, as a tool, as an aid, and we hope it is just that. So thank you again, Dr. Erickson. Our final presenter for this evening will be our head of schools, Grant Beckwith. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We know your time is precious. Thank you to those who are online watching. We're grateful that you're taking the time at home, busy lives. Um, Janet, thank you for that. I, um, we have a dozen trustees like Janet who are grounded deeply in love of the Lord, of family, of this country, of this school, and that kind of leadership it is felt. Um, and you can see, if you know any of these people, you know what I'm talking about here. Um, I'd like to just give our whole board of trustees a big round of applause. Dan Burton is watching the line. Chase. We knew that Chase was the right man for the principal of this American Ford campus job. We felt that on many levels. Uh, he has the heart, he has the mind, the might, the strength to do that job. It takes stamina to do that job. Um, we felt that. But we are seeing that evidenced week after week, month after month. Um, he is the man for the season here. I would like to give him another big round of applause. Just a tremendous job uh, with that fundraising advancement and strategic horizon looking. Uh, it's not easy to connect with people in a way that helps to bring resources. Every cause needs resources to really be magnified and strengthened, including ours. We do not receive a single penny of federal, state, local tax funding here. And so it takes that kind of giving to do what we're doing here together and to have the independence that we have to invite the spirit into our classroom. So thank you for your unashamed and unabashed plea for help. <laughs> Let's give them a big round of applause this well. Okay, we've got Mr. Anderson here, the principal of our Salt Lake campus. If he can just raise his hand. Uh, he has done so much work um, getting ready for this opening in August of 22. I want to show you this little commercial that he and many others put together. 30 seconds. things of the heart, while learning the history of this nation, and she's doing it all, here, where pioneer ancestors settled, where grandparents were married, where truth has touched hearts for generations. The new Salt Lake campus of American Heritage School, education for the heart, in the heart of it all. Raise your hand if you saw that on social media. Yeah? Okay. okay. We'll have a debut here. Just one more. This one was actually shot here, but it's being aired um, on social media and commercial areas around the world. So. These days, there's nothing part time about helping kids succeed. Parents and teachers have to be all in, pulling together, working together so that children can reach their potential. Because in the end, it's not just about passing classes. It's about succeeding in life. At college, on the job, as missionaries, in marriage. That's not something parents can do alone, in the fleeting hours after school and before bedtime. But when the help parents need comes from teachers they trust, there's no limit to what children can do. American Heritage School, parents and teachers, all together now. Yes, that teacher's name really 
is Mrs. Pulley, who's pulling together. That was a great, I don't know if that was on purpose, Mr. Anderson, but a great job. Okay, uh, is Kristen here, Kristen Jansen? Raise your hand, Kristen. Kristen is right there. Okay, she is the new admissions director for all of our campuses combined. And she just wants you, if you know so yeah, let's give her a big round of applause. That's a hard seat to sit in. There's a lot of families to fly in. She just said, hey, look, scan this. If you know someone in the Salt Lake area, boom, forward stuff to them. Really easy. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, American Heritage Worldwide. <clears throat> you saw some very significant donations given to our worldwide program and our online resources for families around the world. We're creating not just an LMS, a learning management system, it is a learning experience platform. And it will be interfaith um, for Christians of other faiths, for other major world religions who want to have a curriculum that acknowledges God in their home, in their classrooms. Um, this is Christy Swenson, who's one of our online instructors. We're taking the video to a whole other level. It's going to be self-directed for students. There's some really cool technology here that allows this to become family education, where family members on, in other parts of the world can participate in giving and contributing content to their children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, um, learning plans. It's called My Path. Uh, you can see just relatives, friends. It's going to be one of the safest and most secure sites, even giving you as parents reports about the, the, the chatting that happens on the system between your child and other children. And it's going to, as I said, it's going to be um, uh, something that can be modified for different faiths and cultures. Um, I'm not going to go into that now. We'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on that another day. <clears throat> on this topic of technology, um, and of healthy sexuality, and boundaries, and love, teaching as parents and, and teachers with love and law. wanted to start by telling you a little story. I have permission from these parents to tell you this story. Um, last week, I, I left my office for just a few minutes. I came back in, and the door was locked. I thought, that's strange. I didn't close the door. So I got my keys out, opened the door. And I walked in, and there were two little boys in first grade. <coughs> this is. This is Calvin and Kate. They were hiding under my desk. <laughs> and they were terrified when I walked in. And I said, hi. Well, actually, before I said hi, I had this like moment. There was this decision I had to make in my heart and mind. Is this going to be a heavy discipline law moment? You don't belong in offices that aren't your classroom, go to you. What do you belong you know? Or is this going to be a love moment? Hey, welcome. I'm so glad to see you, Cal. Okay, let's take a picture together. <laughs> so you can see what I decided to do. I'm not sure it was the right thing, but it was what I felt to do first. So they went back to class. I looked around my office. On my desk, right eye level with these boys, is a little thing that I have that says, keep the cup. It sits on my desk right where I can see it. And on that, sits this little gemstone that someone gave me that reminds me of, of an experience here. And this stone was gone. Okay. <laughs> so after school I went and I found these boys. We just saw each other in the hallway and I said, Dave and Calvin, come here. <laughs> and they were terrified again. <laughs> and I said, I am, it was so good to see you today and you're not in trouble. But I want you to know I'm missing something from my office. It's just a little rock. It looks kind of like a diamond. And if you find it, could you bring it back to my office? I would really love to have it back. It's important. The next day, as I was coming down the stairs, <clears throat> there they were hiding, trying to make it up to my office. And I ran into them again. And they were terrified again. <laughs> Not really. We've become friends by now, right? Friends. And I said, Calvin, kid, how are you? I said, did you find my stone? And one of them pulled it out of his pocket, and I could just see the remorse. And he said, yes, we did. Here it is. And I said, you know, thank you. You did the right thing. Would you come visit me in my office more? The next day they did. They came, and they came into my office, and they brought me something. 
It's a piece of broken glass. It looks kind of like a diamond. It looks kind of like a stone. And now I put it right on this little thing next to the other one that I have as a reminder of how important it is to approach law with love first. This one that they brought to me actually means more to me than this. And they're bringing me more presents than that. I had to call one of the parents and say, just please tell them no more gifts, okay? <laughs> but we're talking now, and we're friends. The other path, the law path, the justice path, if we approach it too soon, too quickly, too heavily as parents, as teachers, it can shut down the conversation. That's the last thing we want. We need for them to feel comfortable talking with us. I'm sure that Janet is going to talk. She's already mentioned it, right? The importance of not shaming them. And so this brings us to divine love and this balance of love and law. This is how we started with our teachers in in-service at the beginning of the year. Why this topic? Why now? Well, it began with a conversation around a fireside with me and some of my nieces and nephews over the summer where I just asked them how they felt about the direction that the world was going, the direction their family was going, the church was going, their faith. And they said, you know, multiple of them said, we think the problem is that all we think the problem is that there's too much there's too many people who are expressing their feelings about justice we think that all we need is love and that's all we need love only and everything will be fine if we just love each other and i started thinking deeply about that is that the way god views us that all he has to do is love us um, I'm not going to go into all the detail that we did with the teachers in talking about this balance, but really, if you think about it, if you listen to President Nelson talking about this, he's been thinking about this for a long time. He talked about the nature of God's love, unconditional love. He said it's, it's infinite, it's eternal, but his love is not necessarily unconditional if you believe that certain blessings are predicated upon obedience to certain laws. This is President Nelson. This is the path we are all on as parents and teachers together. And it's a path, a lifelong path. And I'm on it. I'm trying to figure this out. You're trying to figure it out. What is that balance between love, agency, mercy, and law, accountability, and justice? Whatever it is, we start with love, but we do not leave law out of that equation. Dads, we're on the home stretch here, winding this up, but I'm going to invite you to watch this. Raise your hand if you've seen it already. Okay? I'm going to show you just a little bit of clip, a little clip of this. It's the trailer for it. It was produced by the same company that produced, if you've seen it, some of the facing giants. It's an evangelical Christian, you know, movie-making shop, and they do some good work if you if you're uncomfortable with the evangelical, you know, feel of it, then just stick with it and see what you get from it. Here's a little preview. I've been a good father. At least I've been shown in your vision of the values that they want to hear it is. All of us have a fathering story. My dad was my hero growing up. My father was somebody who disappointed you. To have my father proud was my sole purpose to play football. I want to make a difference in the lives of young people the way my father made a difference in my life. We put a representation of our father in all of our families. I prayed for me and my brother and my mom to get through this night. I think we lived in seven different houses, kind of running from my dad. I started losing my ability to walk. We didn't realize the war that was going on inside of them. Wishing that I could just die. Or why did you get mad at me, Carl? Because I need wisdom right now. I knew that I wasn't prepared to be anybody's mom. I was doing the right thing for him. I had an experience with his madness. Calm down. It is a beautiful thing to have a child. This is why I do what I do. For guys like that. I mean, it was like a hair on the back of my neck standing up. He said, I can tell that you already love her. I do. I would get asked about family history. I didn't have any answers. 
because I didn't know that. You had a baby in 1972 in Allegheny County. She says back, yes. Oh, that's work. I'm stunned. He's real. It's really out there. And this is really, this is really very. And the Bible, the blessing was everything. I declare that you are a beloved son in whom we all are complete. You're pushing all the buttons that men want to hear their dad say. It was the first time I had been called out like that. He was that first man that paid attention to me. He was treating me like a bad wife. Your perfect father in heaven can change the church. Okay. Take some time to watch it, dads. If moms are the only ones coming to school and helping, and they're the only ones gathering the children for prayer and scripture study, if they're, and moms, you are the hand that rocks that cradle and changes the world. But fathers, where are you? Where are we? I get that we're making money. We're providing for our families. But we've got to man up. It's time. This is Mark Zuckerberg. And he will become our children's father if we don't understand what he's trying to do. And I want you to watch his annual AR VR conference where for an hour he talked about the future of our world online and he called it an embodied metaverse. That word gave me chills. It creeped me out. I don't know what embodied means online. But listen to what a prophet said. As he talked about tech, and this is a prophet, this is, this is an apostle who loves to use technology and encourages us to use it wisely. Read carefully, this is from his things that they really are. Read carefully the following quote describing an intense romantic relationship a woman had with a side based boyfriend. And note how the medium of communication minimizes the importance of the physical body. And so P.F. Slider, the man's screen name, became my everyday life. All the tangible stuff fell away. My body did not exist. I had no skin, no hair, no bones. All desire to convert itself into a cerebral current that reached nothing but my frontal lobe. There was no outdoors, no social life, no weather. There was only the computer screen and the phone, my chair, and maybe a glass of water. In contrast, says Elder Bednar, we need to heed the admonition of Paul that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That's another sign. Okay, if anyone's feeling, gosh, this was a heavy parent meeting, <laughs> there's lots of help out there, and we have so much reason for hope. This, if you go to the top of the LDS, of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints .org website, and go to, um, on the top, it's life, and then life help, um, so many wonderful resources if you are someone who is currently needing help understanding how to even start talking about some of these things. I love that Chase said this is your conversation and our conversation at home, not necessarily for the classroom. That's why we gathered you and said this is a required meeting. Right? Okay. Thank you for coming. We love you. We pray for you. We feel your love and prayer for us love and prayers for us. We are in this together. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Grant. You've made it. We're done. End of the meeting. Uh, we'll have a closing prayer by Valerie Osmond, a, a parent here in our parent community. Um, before she comes up, let me just make one last comment. Um, I have invited, we did, this, we did this in our August meeting, I wanted to do it again today just uh, for the benefit of any who are benefited by this. I've invited every speaker, every presenter here to remain afterward, plus a few other members of our leadership team to just answer questions. If you have unanswered questions, if there's questions that, uh, that you came with that were answered or that were prompted by tonight's proceedings that you would like to uh, pursue further with any one of us right now, we welcome your questions. Um, so again, every presenter in tonight's program, plus our American Fork 
assistant principals, our PSO, Parent Service Organization President, Katie Blair, um, our principals for the other two campuses. We welcome your questions and we will linger longer with those of you who wish to linger longer. Thank you for being here, Valerie. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this evening that we can come together as a community, as a school, as a Christian fellowship, and be at this meeting. Thank you for this school. I have such tremendous gratitude for this school and what it gives to our families that we are able to feel like our children are building their foundation upon a rock and not sand. Thank you for the teachers that love our students, our children, that I spend precious time with them every day. Thank you for what they are instilling in our children and the confidence of the Christian character that this school provides. Thank you for the administration. Thank you for the hands that provide a way for families to attend. Thank you for the providence here and the spirit. Thank you for the families and what they contribute and what brings them here. Thank you for the mission of this school. And I pray that you would continue to be blessed and uplifted going forward. And thank you for the vision that the Board of Trustees have and everyone involved in this school and just the tremendous blessing it is. And pray that all who ever are associated step, step a foot on, on this campus, they would just understand how special it really is. We pray that everyone would be able to have a safe night as they travel home and that we would continue out the rest of this remaining school year with abundance and joy and that we would be able to steward one another and that we'd be able to act according to what Mr. Beckwith said with, with love first. What a beautiful message. Thank you for that. Thank you for all that's all those that spoke tonight and that have uplifted us and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.